think class size, teacher compensation, and school revenue have much to do with education quality? If so, the conclusion is inescapable that we are living in a golden age. From 1955 to 1991, the U.S. pupil-teacher ratio dropped 40 percent. The average salary of teachers rose 50 percent in real terms, and the annual expense per pupil, inflation adjusted, soared 350 percent. What other hypothesis, then, might fit the strange data I'm about to present? Forget the 10% drop in SAT and achievement test scores the press beats to death with regularity. How do you explain the 37% decline since 1972 in students who score above 600 on the SAT? This is an absolute decline, not a relative one. It's not affected by an increase in unsuitable minds taking the test or an increase in the numbers. The absolute body count of smart students is down drastically with a test not more difficult than yesterday's, but considerably less so. What should be made of a 50% decline among the most rarefied group of test takers, those who score above 750? In 1972, there were 2,817 American students who reached this pinnacle. Only 1,438 did in 1994, when kids took a much easier test. Can a 50% decline occur in 22 years, without signaling that some massive leveling in the public school mind is underway? In a real sense, where your own child is concerned, you might best forget scores on these tests entirely as a reliable measure of what they purport to assess. I wouldn't deny that mass movements in these scores in one direction or another indicate something is going on. And since the correlation between success in schooling and success on these tests is close, then significant score shifts are certainly measuring changes in understanding. So how does Obama get the money then to do those kinds of things for those policies that you disagree with? Where does that money come from? Well, it comes from you and I, everybody else. If, if you didn't like his policies, you wouldn't have voted for him. If there wasn't certain things that you know, led you to go out and vote for him, then you wouldn't have done it. So what do you think it says when the government is able to spend your tax dollars on things that you disagree with? Um, I don't really shun it. I mean, you know, you got to kind of spread out everybody's money to everything, whether or not you support it or not. How, how does the government actually achieve that, of, of the, the spreading of the money? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I mean, you'd want to know if this is like an important thing and you're willing to support someone in the White House who's, you know, carrying out all these policies and is responsible for all this destructive foreign policy. Like, well, I mean, wouldn't you want to know where that money comes from? Like, how, how the government gets money in the first place? Because, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, cause you, you know it, it comes from somewhere, right? All of us. He's going to get all the money from all of us. But as far as the distribution goes, sometimes there's a simple ignorant bliss about it that all of the American people look to. Would you say that you're in that ignorant bliss? I would say a lot of people are. Are you? Am I? I think I am. I think there's a good chunk of us all right here that are standing out here. And you think it's true that ignorance is bliss? Sometimes, yeah. It's better off not to know. That's kind of a scary proposition. I mean, you, you know the government is like, it's, it's, it's really dangerous. Like, it ends up actually like, hurting lots of people. You bury your head in the sand and say, I'm just going to be an Obama supporter. Between 1960 and 1998, the non-teaching bureaucracy of public schools grew 500%. But oversight was concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. Let him ask his question. So th this is a dovetail. Listen, don't stand for this. Right? You're sitting here like cattle. You have questions. You confront them. They don't want to do it in public. Okay. Well, they, 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 The next question to our panel is Dr. Lowry. I'm not a parent. I have a The 
40,520 school districts with elected boards this nation had in 1960 shriveled to 15,000 by 1998. On the college rung of the school ladder, between 1960 and 1984, the quality of undergraduate education at America's 50 best-known colleges and universities altered substantially. According to a 1996 report by the National Association of Scholars, these schools stopped providing broad and rigorous exposure to major areas of knowledge for the average student, even at decidedly unaverage universities like Yale and Stanford. In 1964, more than half of these institutions required a thesis or comprehensive for the bachelor's degree. By 1993, 12% did. Over the same period, the average number of classroom days fell 16%, and the requirements in math, natural science, philosophy, literature, composition, and history almost vanished. Rhetoric, the most potent of the active literacies, completely vanished, and foreign language once required at 96% of the great colleges, fell to 64%. According to the Journal of the American Medical Association, 33% of all patients cannot read and understand instructions on how often to take medication, notices about doctor's appointments, consent forms, labels on prescription bottles, insurance forms, and other simple parts of self-care. They are rendered helpless by inability to read. Mitt Romney, tell us why, why you want to see him become the next president of the United States. Because he's the guy to get it done. I think it just bleeds in all classes and how, I mean, he likes it to be not just one class is superior to the other classes and just right. how he likes just to keep it all in the same, just, just a, it's just a big change, you know, it's a bigger step up than what it'd be with Obama as the past four years way better. Yeah, I know you, you, you just talked about him, he, he's for all classes. Right. You might have heard of the videotape where Romney was overheard saying, you know, 47% of the public don't take personal care or responsibility right. for their lives. That doesn't sound like he's for all classes, does it? You see, I mean, and that's just, I mean, that's just what people say. I mean, I, I mean, I in really, this case, it's what Mitt Romney said. Right. I mean, you know, it could be just for, you know, just to get the upper, I mean, maybe he's going for the upper class or the middle class or whatever, just whoever he wants them to get to vote, get more votes. I mean, he might just be saying to get more votes, but then again, you know, whatever the population for the upper class is, if it's bigger than that, maybe he did that just, he's yeah. got strategy going on and he's obviously doing better than Obama's if he's got a smart strategy like that. And he reads the Quran. You talked about him going to Reverend Wright's church for 20 years. Yes. But now you, but you also think he's a Muslim. Well, he is a Muslim. His father was a Muslim. His father was an atheist, and his father was a communist. Was his father a Muslim, or was his father an atheist? He's all three. Once upon a time, the United States was a new nation that allowed ordinary citizens to learn how to read well, and encouraged them to read anything they thought would be useful. Close reading of tough-minded writing is still the best cheapest and quickest method known for learning to think for yourself. This was the most revolutionary pedagogy of all. Reading and rigorous discussion of that reading in a way that obliges you to formulate a position and support it against objections is an operational definition of education in its most fundamental civilized sense. No one can do this very well without learning ways of paying attention from a knowledge of diction and syntax, figures of speech, etymology, and so on, to a sharp ability to separate the primary from the subordinate, understand allusion, master a range of modes of presentation, test truth, and penetrate beyond the obvious to profound messages of text. Reading, analysis, and discussion are the way we develop reliable judgment, the principal way we come to penetrate covert movements behind the facade of public appearances. Without the ability to read and argue, we're just geese to be plucked. Our children are mathematically illiterate on purpose. How do I know on purpose? Why isn't this just a basic bad idea? Because the Sustainable Development Plan tells us so. Generally, more highly educated people who have higher incomes consume more resources than poorly educated people who tend to have lower incomes. In this case, more education increases the threat to sustainability. Charlotte Iserby, I owe you an apology. I did not believe for the longest time it was a deliberate dumbing down. 
I thought that dumbing down was a natural consequence of a bad idea. Folks, it's deliberate. Just as experience is necessary to understand abstraction, so the reverse is true. Experience can only be mastered by extracting general principles out of the mass of details. In the absence of a perfect universal mentor, books and other texts are the best and cheapest stand-ins, always available to those who know where to look. Watching details of an assembly line or a local election unfold isn't very educational unless you have been led in careful ways to analyze the experience. Reading is the skeleton key for all who lack a personal tutor of quality. Reading teaches nothing more important than the state of mind in which you find yourself absolutely alone with the thoughts of another mind. A matchless form of intimate rapport available only to those with the ability to block out distraction and concentrate. Hence the urgency of reading well if you read for power. Once you trust yourself to go mind to mind with great intellects, artists, scientists, warriors, and philosophers, you are finally free. In America, before we had for schooling, an astonishing range of unlikely people knew reading was like Samson's locks, something that could help make them formidable, that could teach them their rights and how to defend those rights, that could lead them towards self-determination, free from intimidation by experts. These same unlikely people knew that the power bestowed through reading could give them insight into the ways of the human heart, so they would not be cheated or fooled so easily, and that it could provide an inexhaustible store of useful knowledge, advice on how to do just about anything. In 1835, Richard Cobden announced, there was six times as much newspaper reading in the United States as in England, and the census figures of 1840 gave fairly exact evidence that a sensational reading revolution had taken place without any exhortation on the part of public moralists and social workers, because common people had the initiative and freedom to learn. In a nation of common readers, the spiritual longings of ordinary people shaped the public discourse. Ordinary people who could read, though not privileged by wealth, power, or position, could see through the fraud of social class or the even grander fraud of official expertise. And that was the trouble. Yeah. You know what Jabba Justice is? No. <laughs> gave you that sign. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Do teachers know you guys are here and they're cool yep. with it? Yeah. Our teachers brought us here today. For what? What are you, are you guys protesting? Are you testifying? Or? We're going to talk to him. You know, I don't really know. I guess we're protesting today. Um, we're trying to stop whatever this dude is doing. 